So hello everyone, uh, welcome to all of those who are joining us today virtually and a very warm welcome to those who are joining us today for the first time. So this is our third Cafe Sci event that's been held online and will most likely continue to, to um, have these online for the, for the interim at least. So before we start, um, I'm just going to just go through a few housekeeping uh, for those of you that haven't used Zoom or aren't familiar with how Zoom works. So, at either the bottom or the top of your screen, you'll have a, a panel, and on that panel, it will say um, Q and A for the question and answer. So, if anyone does have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to pop it in there, and then after the presentation, um, I'll look in there and then answer any of the questions that you popped in throughout the presentation. So, we'll have about ten to fifteen minutes at the end of the presentation for for questions. So I'm moving on, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Mark uh, Buttigieg to our virtual Cafe Sci event on childhood vaccinations and, you know, more topical than ever at the moment, vaccinations is one of the major health breakthroughs of the 21st century, which has brought some dr dramatic improvements to child health and, and all health. So I'll hand over to Dr. Mark to talk in more detail about this. And Dr. Mark, over to you. Okay, so thank you very much. and. Uh... Thank you to Queen Mary for inviting me for this Cafe Sai. So I hope this will be interesting for you. Um, what we're gonna cover is um, uh, sort of touch upon all about um, what childhood vaccinations are. Um, in terms of what we're gonna cover, um, this is uh, sort of a quick summary of the points we're gonna touch upon. And we're gonna talk about um, the historic perspectives uh, of vaccine development. Uh, we're going to touch upon as well the issue of vaccine trust and mistrust uh, leading to uh, people questioning the need for vaccination or what's also termed uh, vaccine hesitancy. Uh, we're going to also discuss a number of common uh, myths regarding vaccinations and we're going to try to uh, debunk them with uh, scientific evidence. and. Uh, uh, given that we're in Malta, we're going to touch upon the, um, the current uh, national vaccine schedule, which was uh, significantly uh, ramped up in terms of the amount of vaccines which are currently available uh, through the national health system free of charge um, to our childhood population. Uh, we'll also touch upon some vaccine practical points, which parents time and time again ask us about. And uh, uh, given that it's quite topical, uh, we'll just make a quick mention regarding COVID-19 vaccination development. Um, we're not going to go into much specifics about this because it's obviously a, uh, a work in progress, uh, but nevertheless is of public interest. So I sort of opted to include some questions about this as well. And obviously we'll have some time for uh, questions and answers at the end of the session. And you can always post your questions um, through the uh, uh, appropriate links. So carrying on, so historical human problems, okay, so what uh, have we been fighting against historically? So at the top left you can see uh, war is one of them, uh, and uh, you could say that we're living in a time of peace, but really depends on where you're living uh, and the political will to maintain peace, uh, and that obviously has a, a significant impact on your health. Uh, towards the right, um, the major problems of poverty and uh, lack of food, okay? Uh, and uh, that stems mainly from uh, political will and uh, is influenced by political pressure and the, depending on which country you're living in as well, okay? And uh, these are two problems that we're continuing to strive to improve, um, not only in Western countries, but all, all across the globe. And at the bottom, you can see the, uh, the Grim Reaper over there. Um, we have a number of people who are trying to um, uh, sort of escape death. We're not there yet, uh, but mo most of us mere mortals are just trying to avoid premature death. And uh, vaccine development is par excellence one of the um, major breakthroughs in terms of avoiding premature death, especially in childhood, from uh, communicable diseases. Um, like infections. 
So, smallpox, okay? So this was a major killer up till a few years ago, okay? Um, and in the 20th century, it was estimated that about, about 300 to 500 uh, million deaths were attributed to smallpox. Uh, and coming more recently, um, in 1950, uh, about 15 million people were infected with the, uh, the viral infection, with 2 million deaths being um, documented, pretty much. Um, with a significant drive towards um, vaccination, because we already had a vaccine for smallpox, um, which was um, orchestrated by the World Health Organization back in the 70s, we, um, the WHO managed to um, lead to a global eradication of smallpox. Uh, back in 1979, and this was a major undertaking involving a number of countries um, and a huge amount of human resources to distribute these vaccines to the, you know, the far reaches of the earth. And uh, indeed, nowadays, uh, we consider smallpox as an eradicated condition. It sometimes pops up again um, because of concerns regarding um, uh, biological warfare. Um, but for now, um, there is no indication this is happening. And indeed, um, uh, there is, um, uh, for all intents and purposes, smallpox is eradicated and no children tend to be uh, vaccinated against smallpox. But the vaccine is available in case we need it. And vaccination has its beginning thanks to this um, uh, British medical doctor, Dr. Edward Jenner, who um, being faced with this major problem of smallpox back in the 18th century, um, went on to develop a vaccine which was effective uh, in developing an immunity against smallpox by extracting um, some viral particles from a virus which was affecting cow and it was sort of a similar uh, virus to the smallpox vaccine, uh, smallpox virus which caused the illness in, in humans. And by injecting the, uh, the cowpox uh, virus into humans um, cause an immune reaction, okay? So uh, patients will either be cured of the condition or else uh, it's avoid, avoids these patients getting the condition, okay? So all the vaccination, um, you know, gives its uh, thanks to this individual back in the 1800s. So vaccination, the importance of it, is comparable to things which we take very much for granted. For example, clean water, okay? It's something which we take for granted all the time, but it's not um, a resource which is accessible to all. And also sanitation, okay? Um, adequate sanitation and adequate clean water um, in themselves um, being a norm of our Western society uh, were the cornerstone and led to a significant improvement in both child and adult health and premature deaths, okay? Um, and that's um, the problems with clean water, um, lack of access to clean water and sanitation in certain third world countries um, leads, you know, continues to lead to premature deaths, um, particularly um, due to uh, infectious illness causing uh, gastroenteritis type of symptoms with vomiting and diarrhea, which could lead to dehydration. Okay, so it's these two um, changes have made a significant impact and vaccination is at par with these changes. So um, it looks like a busy slide, but really and truly on the vertical axis, um, you have the um, child and infant mortalities across the, um, uh, the ages, the years, on the um, horizontal axis. And you can see that the slope um, of the mortality rate in both ch children, which is indicated in blue, and in infants, which is, also in, uh, which is indicated in yellow, um, reduced significantly with improvements in sanitation, which mean, as we said before, um, access to clean water and access um, to appropriate sanitation, okay? As you can see at the top part, throughout this period, there has been vaccination um, going from the um, 18th century, starting from Jenner, 19th century as well, 
And as you can see, many different vaccines were developed um, throughout um, you know, the last couple of centuries. Okay? Um, amongst other changes which led to improvements were uh, major developments like, for example, water filtration, chlorination, pasteurization, um, insulin, discovery of insulin by George Best in Toronto, um, iron lungs, okay, for patients who were affected by polio, and antibiotics, okay, um, by Mr. Fleming. Going on to issues with vaccine trust and vaccine hesitancy, and uh, time and time again, we're dealing with anti-vaccine movements, which um, pose a significant threat to global health, because um, these movements um, are, might end up reversing all the improvements we've had over the last couple of decades in terms of improvement in mortality rates in infants and children uh, attributed to vaccinations. And this were, these are some screenshots from um, the BBC back in last year. So what is the reality? The reality is that um, we continue to vaccinate because um, the conditions which we vaccinate against are not eradicated. As we said before, um, we do not continue to vaccinate against smallpox because smallpox is eradicated. Um, measles is not a common condition. Um, it hasn't been eradicated and that's why we continue to vaccinate. But because of the concern of measles being associated with other conditions, which actually is not scientifically proven, um, there has been a reduction in the uptake of these vaccinations in a number of countries, leading to the outbreak of measles um, across the globe, depending on which countries uh, whose uptake was poorest, okay? And the reality is that uh, measles could lead to a severe febrile illness, uh, measles could lead to um, severe neurological complications in the long term. And measles and mumps rubella vaccination has nothing to do with autism, okay? Even though um, the common concern is that it is associated, but really and truly, this has time and time again been scientifically proven not to be associated. So this is a shot of a child with measles. This is the acute illness but as we said, could lead to long-term complications. This is a child who has meningococcal septicemia caused by meningitis B. Again, a uh, preventable condition with vaccination. Very serious condition. So, looking at a poll back in 2018, again published by BBC, uh, indicates uh, countries' vaccine trust, okay? And as you can see, as you go um, towards the bottom of the page, there's an increased um, vaccine trust, and the inverse is true as you go up on the graph, okay? Uh, for the time being, um, most people do trust the safety of vaccines. But unfortunately, because of um, misinformation or fake news sometimes, um, the vaccine hesitancy increases, and it is a continual problem that we're, uh, we as doctors who administer vaccines um, have to face and have to try to give the scientific evidence um, for parents to make, um, to make informed decisions. So looking at Malta, okay, um, during the study. So 95% or so of children in Malta tend to be vaccinated, okay? And a good majority of patients and parents in Malta who were um, asked these questions during the survey uh, indicated that they agree that vaccines are safe. A good proportion also of Maltese respondents um, believe that vaccines are effective. And also, uh, a good proportion, a vast majority uh, of parents feel that vaccines are important for children. And that's a good thing to hear, okay? So vaccines are obviously available and national health systems are continuing to try to um, widen the amount of vaccines uh, which are available to their children um, cohort uh, because 
um, vaccines per se are expensive and uh, if the government can cover the costs that will improve the vaccine uptake. So this is a, um, a, uh, a quote from Dr. Flavia Bustero, uh, who was a former assistant director general um, for family and women's health at WHO. And she states that vaccines are available, but myths around them discourage patients from immunizing their children. Um, our job as medical professionals is to um, bust these myths and promote the benefits of immunizations more widely. So, myths are never ending, okay? But these are a few of the commoner myths that we might encounter. For example, fact number one. So immunization through vaccination is the safest way to protect against disease. So no, um, it is not better to get the disease than to vaccinate against it, okay? So getting a, um, a condition naturally is not always the best option, okay? Because uh, getting the condition naturally will indeed cause immunity, but you might get repercussions of the natural illness, or you might succumb to the natural illness. Fact number two, it's always best to get vaccinated, even when you think the, the risk of infection is low. So most of the time, the infection rate is low because of what we call is a herd immunity. So what a herd immunity is, is that when you have a good proportion of your population being vaccinated, these people who are vaccinated would protect other children who are too young to be vaccinated or other children who are unable to be vaccinated, okay? And the um, uh, risk of infection is low because many people receive the vaccine and therefore do not get the condition. So the inverse is true if everybody decides not to get vaccinated. So fact number three, are combined vaccines safe? Yes, combined vaccines are safe and beneficial. Okay, people um, in the first year of life and in the second year of life of children, um, when I start explaining what vaccines children need to take, um, you know, parents get a bit apprehensive because that means a lot of vaccines in a short period of time. But what is important to remember is that you want to vaccinate children or protect your children at a time which they're most at risk of getting infections, okay? And com combination of vaccines, as occurs in Malta and occurs in the UK or other countries, is safe and beneficial. And it has no negative impact on child's immune system. It, it reduces the discomfort to the child because you get things done in one session. It improves uptake of vaccination. Okay, and you have to appreciate that children are exposed to even more antigens. Antigens are substances within vaccines which in induce an immune response. They're exposed to more antigens from a common cold than they, they are from vaccines. So the fact number four, which always lingers around. So there is no link between vaccines and autism. So there is no scientific evidence to link the MMR vaccine with autism or autistic disorders. And most of the time, Children who have a tendency towards developing autism, which is on the rise uh, across the globe, probably because of increased awareness, um, they tend to develop symptoms of autism uh, at around the time of MMR vaccination. So um, unfortunately, parents um, sometimes run to the um, flawed conclusion that one thing led to the other, or the vaccine led to their children developing autistic features which is really not a scientific conclusion, as we all know, okay? Um, this unfortunate rumor started with a single study in 1998 and was quickly found to be flawed and removed, okay? Fact number five. So if you stop vaccination, deadly diseases will return. And um, uh, this example is clearly indicated by the um, uh, poor uptake of the MMR vaccine, okay? So even with better hygiene, sanitation, and access to safe water, infections will still spread, okay? So um, sanitation and clean water is not enough on its own, okay? So people need to be vaccinated, uh, and infectious diseases that have become uncommon can quickly come back to haunt us, okay? So it's extremely important that um, parents get information from reputable sources, be it their doctor or family doctor, rather than getting information from Facebook or other um, non-credible sources, which tends to be misleading. 
So this is our current um, Maltese vaccination schedule, which is freely available um, on our government website. And uh, on a positive note, uh, over the last few months, the government has invested quite significantly in boosting up um, our current national vaccine schedule. Um, prior to this period, pa um, parents were still able to give more vaccines or sort of um, replicate this current vaccine schedule, but this came at a significant cost for parents. So what is normally given? Okay, so vaccinations normally start from eight weeks of life, um, even if you're born prematurely. Um, and they start with the six in one vaccine, which includes diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, polio, and Hib and hepatitis B. Um, we also give the pneumococcal vaccination, which is against a, uh, a bug, which could cause bacteria, which could cause chest infections and meningitis in children. And we also give meningitis B vaccination. Um, the six in one is repeated again at three months together with the meningitis ACWI um, vaccine. So there is no one single vaccination against meningitis, bacterial meningitis. At four months, we replicate what was given at eight weeks. Then vaccines continue again at 12 months, giving boosters um, and uh, new vaccinations, um, mainly the MMR vaccine at around 13 months, okay? And then you have boosters at a later stage at around three years. So you could see in the first year of life and in the second year of life, there are a number of different vaccines which are recommended, okay? Um, only the first three uh, six in one vaccinations tend to be obligatory by law in Malta. In the UK, none of the vaccines tend to be um, obligatory by law. And obviously um, each country has its own regulations, but I try to insist with parents not to consider it as such. Um, and they should be uh, convinced into the need of taking the vaccines rather than being forced into taking them for various reasons. But schools in Malta might ask um, normally always asks for um, uh, our vaccine history for any child which comes uh, to uh, uh, write up um, to enter any particular school. And schools have the right to refuse children who are not vaccinated properly um, uh, to protect their other children, um, uh, other students in school. Okay. Um, and then at 12 years, the uh, HPV vaccine, which is the cervical cancer vaccine, is given. Um, and that is normally given to um, girls at 12 years of age. And then you have a school leaving boosters uh, between 14 to 16 years. So this is a sheet I normally used to give to parents before many vaccines were added over the last couple of months. And just to get you in the picture, um, the um, vaccine schedule, um, you could see there, the dark gray is what was not covered by the government. So let's compare it to today's. Okay, so as you can see, the dark gray has reduced significantly now. Okay, so that means that much more vaccines were included in the Maltese national vaccination schedule. Now, each and every country um, tends to follow its own um, national vaccination schedule, but more or less, um, they tend to be pretty similar, okay, in terms of um, uh, the timing of the vaccines or what is given, okay? The only currently vaccines which are not covered by the government in Malta um, are the rotavirus vaccine, which is an oral vaccine against the most common type of virus which would cause vomiting and diarrhea in children, and the chickenpox vaccine, which is also not part of the vaccination schedule in the UK, but can be given um, through the private sector. Uh, and also nowadays, um, any patient in Malta may either receive these vaccines at the um, uh, health clinics, uh, the vaccination clinics. Alternatively, patients also have the option of taking free vaccination at their local GP um, of preference. A couple of practical points. So uh, this is something which I always mention to my patients. Okay, so fever uh, post-vaccination may occur within 48 hours of vaccination, okay? So it's extremely important for parents not to bring their children just because they had fever within that 48-hour window uh, after receiving a vaccine and just to give the paracetamol if need be. Parents are also advised not to give paracetamol just in case. 
uh, paracetamol as a medicine, so you'd want to give it in case you need to. Okay? Vaccine as co-administration, as we said before, is safe. Um, there are different types of vaccines, um, sort of which induce different types, types of immune responses. And for example, a chickenpox vaccine or an MMR vaccine are live vaccines, okay? So they can be given together or else four weeks apart. When it comes to preterm children, uh, we also get asked, do we wait till our child is of a comparable age before I give them the vaccine? Um, or do I give it based on their chronological age when they are born? Actually, they have to follow the chronological age from birth um, for vaccination. And the reason being is once a child is born, uh, they're at risk of any communicable disease um, outside the womb. Okay, so vaccination still remains important. In terms of contraindications um, for vaccination is that if a child gets a severe acute febrile illness, which develops high grade fever or is really unwell, it's extremely important uh, for you not to vaccinate your child, okay? Also, you should not vaccinate your child for a particular vaccine if they've had a previous local severe or systemic reaction to a particular vaccine. Doesn't mean that you cannot give other vaccines. Um, sometimes we also vaccinate in a hospital setting in case that we're concerned about an allergic reaction. If you have a child for whatever reasons on steroids or is immunosuppressed, meaning having an immu a weak immune system, that might be a contraindication for certain vaccinations, but then your doctor will guide you accordingly. And if a child has a progressive undiagnosed neurological condition, um, it's also might be a, um, a contraindication to vaccinate. The following are not contraindications to vaccines, okay? A previous history of an infection to the condition, a stable neurological condition, if a child is on antibiotics and is well, um, if there is a history um, uh, to aller of allergy, part it depends which type of allergy, um, if you're uh, breastfeeding, there is no contraindication to vaccination. Um, if you are a sibling of a child who is immunosuppressed, contacts a pregnant woman or children who have joined this in the neonatal period. So we're nearing the end of the talk um, and we'll touch upon COVID-19 vaccination, okay? And more than giving answers, I just want to pose a couple of questions, okay? Uh, which probably are running through your head, okay? So um, when and will it be ready, okay? Um, I mean, you can ask somebody when it will be ready, you can ask WHO, you can ask um, governments, and they all give you different information, okay? Um, so we'll know when, it's, when it will be ready, okay? Um, some believe that it will be ready by the end of the year, some believe it will be ready early in the first quarter of next year. Uh, we're not there yet, okay? Will it be effective? Okay, it's useless to be ready if it's not effective. Okay, so, um, and being effective means that it induces an immune response, a safe immune response in a patient who receives the vaccine and the immune response is robust or strong enough to prevent uh, the condition um, if the patient comes in contact with COVID-19. Will it be safe? Obviously, that's one of the main questions uh, which runs through our head. Um, once you inject something into your arm or before that. Uh, and the bottom three authorities are um, the three main authorities which have to ensure that it will be safe. So you have WHO, um, our European counterpart is the European Medicines Authority, uh, and the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration uh, Authority, which is the main authority in the US. Okay, so the question always remains, okay? Um, is this a conspiracy for pharmaceutical companies to make money off us, okay? Do pharmaceutical companies really consider our health a priority, okay? So these three authorities will have to um, sort of take um, our best interest at heart and ensure that pharmaceutical companies um, do not do this for their own gain, okay? And give us a safe and effective vaccination within um, a good time frame. So who will ensure the vaccine is safe? As we said, these authorities and each country has its own authority. The issue of vaccination being compulsory, 
okay? That's a double-edged sword, okay? So people have, when people believe in vaccination and believe that the authorities are ensuring that a vaccine is safe, a vaccine is effective, um, and uh, there is no secondary intentions behind pharmaceutical companies, um, me uh, medication should be, or vaccination should be compulsory because then people will have, would be able to make an informed decision about vaccination. But yes, it's extremely important that when a vaccine, a safe vaccine is available, that the uptake of this vaccine is um, as good as possible so that um, we will have an adequate herd immunity. And the um, aim is, is for um, healthcare professionals and vulnerable individuals, be it the elderly or immunocompromised individuals, to take the vaccine first. And then this vaccine will be rolled out to the wider population, okay? And that will, that answers who will be vaccinated first. Um, there are at least 200 trials as we speak, um, which are studying um, the, um, or trying to develop a COVID-19 vaccination. And about 35 to 40 studies are at an advanced clinical trial stages, okay? And the UK, for example, is uh, pretty advanced as well, okay? And we hope that we receive a safe vaccine, an effective vaccine um, in the shortest time frame possible, uh, but ensuring, uh, above all, our safety. Besides the COVID-19 vaccination, I strongly advise that um, more, um, more than previous years that people are vaccinated against the seasonal uh, influenza vaccination, okay? Because um, coming this winter, um, both COVID-19 and inf seasonal influenza will be coexisting. And um, it is a possibility that you might get, if you're not vaccinated, you might get the both conditions at the same time. Uh, which could um, increase mortality significantly. And as far as we can do, um, let's try to avoid what we can. And until we have a, COVID, a safe COVID-19 vaccination, we will have, uh, for sure, coming uh, the next few weeks, a safe um, seasonal influenza vaccination, as we always had every year. Um, and we have to do our best to take that vaccine. I'm taking it. I hope you will too. So coming to the end uh, of this talk and uh, giving space for questions. So vaccines is one of these era's greatest health achievements. And I hope I um, uh, brought this across. And time for your questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Mark. So as I said at the beginning, uh, we really do welcome your questions. So to ask a question, um, if, you, if you either it's either at the bottom or the top of your screen, um, open that we've got our first question just come through if you just type in your question then i'll i'll read it out for dr mark to answer okay so our first question is uh, how soon can adverse reactions show up in the following vaccinations what are your recommendations when a child experiences this fear reaction and what should parents do okay so um whenever you um inject the vaccine that will induce um a an immune response Okay, that doesn't happen immediately. Um, that happens over a number of hours. And uh, I mean, the normal, I mean, the most common type of um, uh, reactions um, post vaccinations are mild, namely fever or swelling or redness around the vaccination site. Um, so, normally, if any adverse reactions were to occur, uh, they would normally occur. Um, within a few hours of receiving the vaccination and definitely within the 48 hour time window. Uh, going to the same question, um, answering Daniela, um, what are your recommendations when a child experiences a severe adverse reaction? So if it's severe adverse reaction, which is something which you cannot predict, um, it's extremely important to seek medical advice. And obviously um, hospital a es are open 24 seven uh, and it's extremely important to seek medical advice as soon as possible, just in case there's an allergic reaction which requires immediate treatment. Okay, thank you. So our next question, um, are vaccines for children compulsory? 
Right. So obviously it depends which country you're living in. Um, as we said, in the UK, no vaccines are compulsory. And in Malta, the, um, the, two, the second, third and four month vaccines, actually the diphtheria, tetanus and pertussis uh, and polio vaccinations tend to be compulsory in Malta. Um, and obviously, um, if a child is not vaccinated in Malta against those three, can, three or four conditions, um, uh, a, uh, the vaccine clinic will be sending a letter to parents um, sort of indicating the importance of vaccinations and uh, indicating the, uh, what the law states. Um, other countries um, have imposed compulsory vaccination. Depends which country you're living in. Normally this was instigated because of extremely poor uptake of vaccinations leading to re-emergence of communic communicable diseases. Okay. So our next question is regarding the vaccine schedule, why don't you recommend spacing out the vaccines using an alternative schedule? For example, increasing the, interv the intervals between one vaccine and another. And then the second part of that question is, is there any correlation between vaccines as to when they were given? So um, in terms of how we space out vaccinations, so um, whenever any medication or vaccination is introduced, there is a summary of product characteristics, which is called an SPC. And the SPC clearly indicates um, when a particular vaccine should be given, at what age, and how they should be spaced out. Okay, so normally um, national vaccine schedules follow these SPCs um, and uh, the idea is trying to follow these SPCs as closely as possible and trying not to space out the vaccination um, wider than it's supposed to be because uh, you have to appreciate that we do not give one vaccine against any condition because each dose boosts the other and if you space them out too much what can happen is um, that um, you might lose the immunity that you receive from the first vaccine and the second vaccine might not do a, such an effective job as it did before. Um, is there a correlation between vaccines as to when they are given? Obviously, um, national health vaccination schedule um, is spaced out in an appropriate manner uh, to follow the SPCs um, and uh, um, it sort of, you could say, guarantees that the vaccine is as effective as possible to whoever is given these vaccines. Okay. So moving on to our next question. So when can newborns, and you know what age is newborns, be given the regular influenza vaccine? So when it comes to the seasonal influenza vaccine, um, the lowest age limit to receive the vaccine is from six months of age. And in fact, in Malta, um, it is given free of charge every year to children from six months up to five years of age. Um, beyond five years of age, it can still be given to children, but patients will, uh, parents will have to self-fund. And normally, um, uh, the influenza vaccine, if you're giving it for the first time um, in children under three years, they need to be given two doses six weeks apart. Um, but then subsequently, for future seasonal influenza vaccines, they only need to be given one shot of the seasonal influenza per season. Okay, so moving on to our next question. So when children have not been vaccinated in early childhood, it is, is it too late to vaccinate them later on in life? Will the vaccines have the same effect on the child when given later on in life? So obviously um, you would want to follow the national vaccine schedule as closely as possible but um, usually it's better late than never. Um, I mean, the longer you take to vaccinate your children, the more time um, there is for your child to be exposed to any communicable disease, okay? So it's never too late, but earlier is better than later because prevention is better than cure. Um, and will vaccines have the same effect on the child when given later on in life? So again, some childhood vaccines um, are not relevant um, to children who are adults, okay? Um, so really and truly, it, it depends on what age um, uh, you're gonna give the vaccine, um, uh, what age group you're gonna give the vaccine to, and it depends on what exposures this patient has and what previous vaccines 
um, this patient has had. So there are always uh, catch-up vaccine programs which you can uh, latch on to. Uh, it's extremely important that um, any parent who has a child who um, I mean, they feel that they've uh, missed out on vaccines is to bring their vaccine record to their uh, family doctor um, or the vaccine clinic and see if they can get up to date with the vaccines um, at the earliest. And then this appears to be our last question. So um, you mentioned neurological disorders um, as contraindication to vaccination. What is the, the rationale behind that? So as a, as a major contraindication to vaccination is if, if a child has a progressive neurological disorder. Now, so if you have a child who has an undiagnosed or a progressive neurological disorder, it's normally advisable not to vaccinate that child at that point because um, you do not want to give any other um, sort of external factors which might have uh, potentially an impact on the child's condition, okay? Um, because if a child has a progressive condition, you could make the condition uh, potentially worse in the short term by giving vaccination. Um, and normally if a child is still under investigation for a neurological condition, um, it's important to come to a conclusion about this um, neurological condition and um, to ensure that the condition is stable um, before you vaccinate. And it depends also what time frame um, is needed for this condition to remain stable because um, sometimes we still opt to vaccinate patients who have progressive neurological conditions uh, if the condition is prolonged, okay, just to avoid these children not being protected against potential communicable diseases, which could put them at risk. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Mark. Thank you very much for joining us today as well a very you know, informative and topical uh, presentation. Thank you to everyone for joining us virtually at, at home or wherever you may be. And I just you know, want to say, please do keep an eye on you know, the Facebook pages, the meetup group, um, and however you found out about the event today, as we will be looking to run another Cafe Sci event virtually again next month. But finally, thank you again and stay safe everyone and we look forward to um, seeing you again next month.